we have organized today's discussion on the recently announced uh, national uh, health data policy and we will be beginning the presentation uh, shortly within 5 minutes uh, we'll just wait uh, for a few more friends and comrades to join till then uh, but while that happens uh, maybe uh, i could give a bit of an introduction of uh, why we thought about having this discussion today and uh, to our uh, two speakers who have joined us uh, prasanna s uh, and uh, silvas kodali uh, so the topic for today's discussion was uh, sensitive medical data on sale uh, what is in the national uh, health data policy for citizens and corporations uh, Today, the first of August, uh, it marks first uh, of uh, September. It marks three years since the institutional murder of Dr. Anita, an aspiring uh, medical student uh, who had to uh, uh, who died by suicide uh, because of the institution of uh, centralized uh, exams in in uh, the medical system. Uh, 2017 was also the year in which the uh bjp led uh, government announced the national health policy 2017 it was an update to the last policy which had come out in 2002 and uh, uh this policy uh, laid out some uh, broad contours of what would follow over the next 3 years and what we are seeing today uh, so in this policy what was debated was the aspect of healthcare not being made a judiciable right but rather being kept as an assurance based uh, entity and uh, it has been uh, spoken about uh, at length uh, sorry here's the lag with the stage just give me a second yeah uh, and uh, with the 2017 national health policy moving towards an assurance based model bringing in more private players and uh, moving towards a model where uh, the state would subsidize uh, health insurance premium instead of investing directly in the public health infrastructure and from there we move on to july 2018 when niti aayog announced uh, its uh, policy document on national health stack a set of public apis which would integrate a digital id uh, for every indian citizen a unique id which would be uh, applicable for them uh, in the healthcare system at large and also connected to other data management systems run by the government such as the aadhaar database such as natgrid under the home ministry and so on so on 26th uh, of august uh, 2020 when the national health authority announced the uh draft national public data uh, pu pu uh health data policy uh much of it was not a surprise perhaps some of it had already been spoken about at length but what was uh, surprising and what has gotten the most attention perhaps has been the uh widespread uh, uh powers being given now uh for data very sensitive data related to medical history financial status caste and religion and other demographic features as well as other sensitive uh, private data of citizens to be gathered and transferred onto public databases which will be linked to third party service providers third party service providers and as our speakers i'm um, sure will tell us the details of what is in this new draft uh, is something that we've seen repeatedly in number of public uh, documents uh, related to data management in india uh, uh, most notably with this document as well we have a number of uh, volunteers uh, private individuals who have been working on drafting this policy uh, similar to what we had with the aadhaar database who in the, the case of aadhaar had even gone on to launch their own for profit ventures using the aadhaar database after it was launched uh, so we have a uh, a uh, lot of things which are not entirely unprecedented and at the same time we are entering a new world of uh, public data management where vast amounts of data which we had never seen before is being centralized gathered and being sold uh, by the uh, narendra modi regime uh, today 
Uh, so, without, I think we already have a few people who've uh, joined in. So maybe we can start off with today's uh, discussion. Uh, our first speaker this evening will be uh, Srinivas Kodali. Srinivas is a, a civic hacker, a technology uh, enthusiast, and a someone committed towards uh, a free and open society, and uh, who writes uh, frequently on uh, the government's uh, policies related to data. And uh, Srinivas, this is the second time he's uh, joined us uh, during this lockdown. The last time he was able to uh, make time for the program was when we were discussing the Arogya Setu app, which had just been launched. Uh, so it's great to uh, have Srinivas back. And uh, our second speaker will be uh, Advocate uh, Prasanna S., Advocate on Record in the Supreme Court. Uh, he's a, a lawyer who has uh, worked on several petitions related to public data and uh, who has also written extensively about uh, uh, this and other schemes related to uh, public data. So without uh, any uh, further ado, I'd like to uh, welcome uh, Srinivas for his presentation. And after both the speakers have concluded, we'll have a question and answer session. So Srinivas, over to you. Uh, thank you, Saurya. I, I hope I'm audible. Uh, so, I think uh, it's it's important to understand the first consultation on health data. Okay, there have been at least three other consultations. Uh, I mean, if you look at in privacy, that this new health uh, data management policies to and uh, uh, ensured uh, privacy for citizens. Uh, it was actually the Disha Act, uh, the Digital Information Security in Healthcare Act, uh, whose consultations happened in uh, around 2018 April. Idea of what happened with the Act. Uh, post the Act, in fact, you had the Health Penalty, then you had the National Digital Health uh, Blueprint consultations, right? So. In terms are about health data, uh, but this is the first consultation. And we three consultations uh, only progressed without actually taking any citizen concerns around this piece, right? Uh, there were some of these consultations. Most importantly, the issue of anonymized data. Right? So if you are asking why are we having this new national health data policy consultation, uh, it's because the healthcare industry, or rather actually the IT industry, wants health data, so data industry, uh, especially led by the insurance agencies. So, so it's basically... On top of fintech, you're getting a healthcare industry. And if you look at how this has been pushed, uh, the health stack itself is considered as a next layer of India stack about uh, 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 identification and fintech, right? So you know, if, if one asks, why are we getting this now? I mean, the plans to build a healthcare uh, digital ecosystem has been there for a while, since 2017. Uh, but if you go back further in time, and if the UID AI was trying to push, uh, how they were trying to push Aadhaar into healthcare, documents from US suggesting that Aadhaar be linked to healthcare so that uh, electronic health records can be linked with Aadhaar, and they, then they can use this data for providing better welfare services and better identification and whatnot. So, while most of these ideas are like quite utopian, uh, they don't really on ground issues of India. For example, in terms of uh, actual infrastructure, actual healthcare infrastructure that is across the country, uh, the management policy will not it. The idea essentially is that oh, we will gather data about everybody in the country and based on the data. Data viewing uh, healthcare facilities. Once you got 
healthcare choice rather than I would say a healthcare for all, uh, which is what it's being promoted as because it's part of the national health digital mission. Now, if one asks the question of whether this is harmful for privacy, or this is okay. Uh, the most important problem at play here is uh, what you're witnessing is the hotel law. Okay, I think Prasanna will go deeper into the issue around the law and why we need a law for this health ID. Uh, but the aspect of health ID, the new national health ID that has been announced by Modi, is and, and mind you, he clearly states every Indian will be given a health ID. It's it's while you can claim it's a voluntary ID at the stage, it's it's not going to be a voluntary. It's going to be forced on people without a national health ID. Uh, one may not be even be able to get inside a hospital, and we have seen enough incidences of denied the uh, healthcare services in hospital for them not having other. Uh, there have been enough reports of people unable to uh, get a hospital bed. Uh, while most of these are documented, there, there are a quite a uh, number of documented data at the Ministry of Health and the DBT mission itself, which clearly say there have been a significant number of exclusions because of Aadhaar in healthcare. Now, uh, then with all of this, if we aren't really fixing the existing healthcare service delivery, why do we need a new national ID? Uh, it's simple because transfer health stack, where you're trying to collect electronic health records of every citizen in the country, requires will be uh, linked to all of this health data so that the health data between hospitals to clinics or diagnostic centers. Uh, so you're essentially building what these people term as information highways. Now, the only problem with building information highways is that a highway, you need land. Uh, and then in this case, you need data happens that the Indian government has the concept of eminent domain where it can claim that all land belongs to the government of India and it can claim it. It is trying to build national development projects and need not compensate you or compensate you merely. In the case of data, what the government is essentially doing, has been doing since Aadhaar, data about Indian citizens belongs to the government and the government can essentially use this data to build uh, private ecosystems and to promote uh, India's economic interests, right? Why is this happening? Uh, it's very clear now after the Hoover and the India stack uh, issue. Uh, India, I mean, there is a report if more people want to read it. It's called the TAGAP report, Technology Advisories Group uh, Report, So it's at, which is where Mr. Nilikani recommends that India build utilities. And what you're witnessing now in case of health is essentially India is building information infrastructures related to healthcare, where all the data about Indian citizens be uh, they, while they're claiming it's not centralized databases, but it is definitely centralized. Because uh, if you look at the word, it's a national health data policy, right? Uh, but health as such is a very, a very specifically under the constitution is uh, in the state. Health is a state su subject and states are responsible for public health care. Uh, the, the central government, in fact, has uh, not much of a role to the policies. While they can promote uh, some of the uh, practices, uh, they are in an advisory capacity rather than an on-ground uh, role. Now, if you look at some of these issues, uh, most of these are being pushed. By the act, if you look at some of uh, what the center has been doing, to build these national health stack and the national health data repository, 
they have been asking states to share all the data from uh, states so that they can actually build these existing systems. Uh, the Secretary of uh, Health, the Ministry of Health, has actually written to the states uh, a month back, I guess, to share all of their uh, health data so that this uh, database can be built. Now, the problem in all of this is because there is no law, uh, there's nothing stopping the states to share this data. And the sta states are actually actively sharing all of your health data. Now, if you're asking what data, what kind of health data does a state actually have on you, uh, it's almost uh, every time part of a healthcare welfare program, or even if you are getting some rare disease, like COVID, for example, right? In case of COVID, if you tell, test positive, all of your information is collected by the government departments. Now, now think of, uh, uh, so the state uh, genuinely has a responsibility towards uh, pregnant mother and child, uh, the newborn child. So the state has to essentially vaccinate people. Uh, so they really need to understand uh, how a, a pregnant mother is, how her uh, health records are. So, which is one of the reasons why they actually demand Aadhaar whenever you go, whenever you're pre pregnant and when you go to a healthcare facility for check for the checkup. And uh, actually there have been instances where a lot of the data, uh, data of uh, pregnant women with their husband's details, their uh, medical details, including their blood pressure, the blood type, uh, the order of pregnancy, all of this has been leaked in, in the case of Andhra Pradesh, right? Uh, and mandatory under existing laws, under uh, state interest to uh, track maternal mortality rate and vaccinating the newborn chains. Uh, so the government does in a fiduciary capacity maintain a lot of health data about its citizens. And most of this data is centralized uh, now. It, it was not centralized before, but with the uh, help of these digital systems and with other centralized. Uh, the whole uh, uh, condition of that, unless you share your other number, we will not be able to provide welfare part of the Consolidation Fund of India, a part of other act, that unless states share all of this data with center, not going to refund or, or give money to states to actually fund these welfare programs, right? So the, essentially the center has been armed twisting the states to collect a lot of data about citizens that the states maintain. And now what you're witnessing is uh, all of this in, by, by essentially collecting all the data from states and by building these centralized architectures, uh, government is essentially converting every citizen into a potential user and a consumer uh, for new health tech startups that might emerge. So the idea here is to promote a health uh, tech industry. Uh, uh, the emphasis is more on that and, uh, and the emphasis is not on universal health care. If you're looking at universal health care, the first thing you'll probably look at is what are the challenges for it? And I think uh, the primary issue would be is uh, public infrastructure, lack of public infrastructure. Uh, but I think at some level, the government realizes that they do not have the money to spend on public health. Instead of accepting that what it's essentially doing is it's privatizing health at, at a large scale. Now, modifications, uh, right? While it may be good for... Uh, a certain class of citizens, right? Especially educated when, when you have health insurance because you're employed and your your company is providing those health insurances. Uh, it's, 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 it's great. But to the marginalized, uh, unless uh, they share all of their healthcare data, the state in some ways is saying that through Aishman Bharat, we will ensure that you get healthcare. Uh, but they, there, are, there are instances where they don't receive this and are being forced to share their data that some healthcare service be provided, right? Now, this coercion, this uh, push to collect a lot of healthcare data is essentially this data with the private sector. And uh, 
with the uh, whole non-personal data committee bill, right, which actually recommends that anonymized data can be shared with private sector. Uh, this whole game of most health data is anonymized. By default, it's stored as anonymized data, uh, except there are provisions on issues of re-identification. Like, they, are, they have a list of people who have tested positive for a rare disease, and they really need to identify these people to quarantine them or they want to really uh, uh, look at solving this issue. There are provisions part of the national uh, digital health blueprint where re-identification is allowed. But under the draft data protection bill and also part of the non-personal data committee bill, uh, and de-anonymization of data is illegal. And without those bills, uh, this policy doesn't really make any sense. So if you look at the National Health Data Management Policy, uh, it basically talks about all the issues. It essentially codifies National Health Stack. Anything that the National Health Stack is doing, uh, it's written in code. And code is being translated into law. You really can't translate code into law because code uh, post, we really don't know what the code is doing. To convince yourself that okay, we have this policy, and uh, everyone must assume in good faith that the code that's been written for National Health Stack is actually following this policy. Now, the problem uh, that we why why we don't have a law and why we are getting a policy is essentially. Uh, they really don't know how this uh, national health stack architecture is going to evolve. Until it's fully finalized, only makes it a hindrance for some of these uh, uh, people who are building the uh, national health stack to share this data with the private entities. Without a law, it's, it's far easier for the government to break rules and do whatever it wants in the name of innovation. But a law would essentially stop all of these uh, practices that are illegal. Now, uh, the other important question to ask is, who are the people who are building the National Health Stack? National Health Stack is, it was proposed by ISPERT, uh, it's Indian Software Products Industry Roundtable, a lobby group which has interests of Indian IT sector, and some of the uh, volunteers uh, who built other are, are the ones who essentially joined uh, iSpurt and have been building India Stack, which is other UPI, eSigny, KYC, and now they are building the Health Stack. This is not the only thing that they are building. It's a part of a larger digital ecosystem that, they, that these people are trying to build these digital platforms or digital infrastructures, and most of them are being done without any loss. As a society, we are being forced to digitize without laws, without any actual debate. And what you are essentially doing at some level is, uh, they're actually copy-pasting Estonia. I don't know how many of you know about Estonia's digital garment system. In Estonia, everything's digitized. They also have a digital ID, uh, which is a smart card with a chip. Uh, they ha their voting is digitized, their health data records are digitized. So everything and anything of government aspects in Estonia is digitized. And we are essentially trying to copy paste it, except you know, uh, the accountability measures are embedded in the software. If you look at code as law, if software as law, which is executing the, the rule of law, the accountability measures are embedded in that software. But that's something that we are not witnessing in India. All the accountability measures are, do, either do not exist or are overruled or, uh, or the government tries to fix the problems of code with a law, which essentially says uh, uh, de-anonymization of data is illegal, but it's technically feasible. So whenever someone does it, we have a law to punish those people. Uh, but they are not ruling out those possibilities. All they're trying to do is essentially say that, don't worry, we will take care of things, but all in good faith. Uh, I will stop it there, but essentially all of this is to build uh, a digital economy for India. 
and this digital economy is being built without any larger debate in the parliament, inside the parliament or outside. I think uh, that was a wonderful overview uh, wonderful. Uh, that Srinivas has provided, dates from 2011's uh, tag-up report to the latest 26 August uh, uh, draft national public uh, health data policy. Uh, and I think one uh, analogy that was used really stood out where Srinivas mentioned the same way that governments have been forcibly taking land under uh, imminent domain and transferring it to land banks, selling it to corporates. We are witnessing a new ecosystem where forcibly the central government is coercing citizens to give up their private data and creating an ecosystem where it becomes uh, what the document calls a strategic seller uh, to various uh, private interest groups. Uh, so now I'd like to uh, call on uh, Prasanna to talk in more detail about this particular draft that has come out and what are these in, its implications for public health in India and for data security of India. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Shorya. Thank you, Srinivas. Uh, so, there are three aspects that I want to touch on. One is the reason. Why does this exist? And number two, is what is the politics behind this? And what I see is the politics behind this. And number three is the contents of the policy and how does it measure up measure up to our existing law. Right? So number three is going to be more informative. Number two is going to be a bit of masala. Yeah. It's going to be a little bit of self-reflection on us as the as somebody who wants to resist this, uh, this insatiable hunger for data that ours seems to have. So when I look at, okay, so when this policy came, so I looked at, okay, so what was the reason? The reason was, the given reason given was that, see, uh, we need to build the database. What do you want to do is the same as why do you want to do it? This is how they've dumped us all down into thinking. They've beyond the realm of contestation, the goal that this kind of database has to be built. They've indicated that this national health database has to be built. In the policy as to why. Then you need to go back with three, four loops to find out what is it that drive drives this. Then you go back to the digital health mission. And then to the day health stack. <laughs> health stack, you go to the 2017 policy, and there you see one statement that says we want health and well-being for all citizens and better and quality better access to quality health care. So it, what does it mean? So now you've gone to a point where either the government doesn't know what the difference between an amorphous vision is and a, a crystallized goal is. When you have a policy, you do it for a particular goal. Well, the necessary attribute of a goal as against an amorphous vision is that you will, you are able to find out if a particular goal has either been attained or not attained. So when you say, when for example in the US, somebody like a Bernie Sanders proposes healthcare for all, Medicare for all, it is a goal that you can find out if you look at the draft whether there is guaranteed Medicare and medical insurance for every citizen. When you look at this draft, you'll never get, never try, you'll never find out what is it, what is the healthcare guarantee that you're getting. There are no guarantees. All it says is that see, government is in the business of, yeah, therefore we want to build databases. And there is really no explanation as offered as to how A and B fit in. So in this shows something that I've never done so far in these 10 years that I've worked with Aadhaar and Aadhaar related issues. At least 
uh, was introduced, the team actually put out se- several white papers, Aadhaar and PDS, Aadhaar and Health, etc. Right? Particularly in Aadhaar and PDS, they said, see, our goal is to ensure that every person um, every person gets the entitlement that he is entitled to. And this, this adoption of this technology, this is why we think it will kind of uh, access. And then, of course, their claims were, I mean, disproven and how they didn't, I mean, there was, there's a lot of literature on how they didn't add up quite heavily. And therefore, you know, because those claims were fairly crystallized claims, we could actually take them on. Now, what is happening is that you have this amorphous vision that nobody can disagree with. And quality healthcare for us citizens, yes, agree with. But then they've put the next step as to build a database outside the realm of consultation, uh, uh, contestation. And now we are, we are now forced to debate within the frame of that they've set. That is to say, yes, we need to build this database. Now you tell us how, uh, I mean, what are the protections we have, right? So in fact, that's, I mean, it's effectively, they've actually put us into the quicksand. And how have they put out? And even this, when it comes, we know how, uh, how does it come? You say you have a deadline of one week. Within 3rd September, you need to give consultation. I mean, they've been very generous and extended it by another week, I'm told. So... <laughs> So what, what is the consultation in tenure in one week or two weeks that can be done? So this is at a time government has had no opportunity to meet, right? The courts are functioning like the one-tenth of the capacity that they normally do, right? I mean, I'm giving an approximate value. Please don't hold me to give me the, ask me to give you numbers on this. Of course, I don't have it, but say it's about one-tenth of its capacity is where they're working. There is, it's it's difficult to organize opposition. It is have an organized effort at pushing back against this. So this is like a godsend. Wants to be that that I mean that intends to be oppressive, right? So you say, okay, this is this is a policy that we want to do. How do we push it down the throat? A draft. Um, uh, we, of course, we need to give. I mean, give a picture of. You know, there's this, okay, this consultation happening. So we give you that one, the nominal one week thing so that we can check a box again, box against that. So we do it that way. Or, or normally it's the precedent for us to give an extension, one week of extension. Therefore, we are not departing from that precedent. And you do all of that. So effectively, there's no consultation. There's, there's only consultation on the draft itself. And... Coming to the politics of it, who drafts this? Let us look at who drafts this. Yesterday, there was uh, Raman Chima of the Internet Freedom Foundation and the Access Now outed it. Uh, from the attributes of the PDF document that have been put out, we know who has drafted it. It is drafted by somebody from Bidi Legal. And so, I mean, if people have had access to the ET Prime account on um, how Bidi Legal has effectively operated with a lot of power, power to set these terms of engagement that we have, but very little accountability, right? So this this is uh, as to what is the accountability structure for these kind of think tanks that are effect, I mean, that are in bed with the government, right? There's no other, I mean, I don't think we should be mincing words there, be in bed with the government. I'm going around as though there are some independent uh, offering independent professional services, which is, yeah, which is a laughable claim, uh, and has also been not transparent about their engagement to Vidi. In fact, in the previous instances, it has been it's been a precedent where they, if they are using somebody for drafting services for consultation, etc., they they get to put out yes, these are the people we con- uh, consulted, and this is what we think are, there should be the terms under which we should engage. Right. So even that. Um, level of transparency is missing, and that's that's that the reason only the government can tell us. And I also don't want to make it something. I mean, maybe we're asking questions of Vidhi. I mean, I'm, I'm sure. I think our primary target here is the government. It has not acted certainly like a responsible government. If it if it a democratic process under which a policy like this has to be discussed, certainly they should have given 
much more time. First of all, they should have had the honesty to say, what is it that this policy is trying to achieve? Can't give us an amorphous reason. They, I mean, they can't pass a law saying that this law will achieve world peace. First of all, we know it will not be achieved. And number two is like, why when they achieve world peace? Right? And that's effectively what they're trying to uh, tell us. And that also is a reflection on us as to what our resistance, right? It clearly sees that it, it doesn't think much of it, much of us at all. Right? Because we've seen that degradation of the white papers that was put out by Aadhaar, where even there, there was so much opposition. In fact, in this parliamentary standing committee, we know rejected the Aadhaar bill, the first bill that came in 2011. And this, all of that doesn't seem to have scarred the government at all. They just think this can be pushed through, pushed down our throats, and the resistance will only be a whimper. And to see how is it that it doesn't happen. Uh, there are certain tools that we have for resistance. Of course, uh, the 2017 judgment in Puttaswamy is, uh, uh, is certainly our favor, right? It is, as Srinivas indicated, there's one thing. So once privacy is at play, all, I mean, in fact, government's own legislation, several legislations treat health data as sensitive private information. So once this private information is at play, any state measure necessarily requires law. Where is this law? There is no law as on date. It is not, I mean, some people, uh, some certainly some writers have taken the view that the data protection law is necessary. My, my own sense is that it is necessary but not sufficient. For this measure specifically, there has to be a separate law, although there are general data protection principles that ought to be there in a general data protection law. That has to be adhered to and there also has to be specific power sanctioned by parliament-made legislation for this measure. You know, if you're particularly... Uh, building a massive database, although, I mean, you certainly can pay lip service to federalism saying that it's a federated database, some data is going to be stored at the state level, some other data is going to be at the central level. We know a federated database is a euphemism for a centrally controlled database, it's, but data only sits elsewhere and not, not at one place. But the control still is at one place, right? That's that's something that even the policy concedes. So, so long as that control exists at one place, it will still have a single point of failure, single point of accountability that we must be able to demand. And uh, none of it exists in the policy. Uh, so, so for first step, yes, there's no law. And number two, there has to be justifiability on why that law is necessary. What is the compelling state interest? Right? Of course, I mean, lawyers will tell you compelling state interest is not our standard. It is the US standard. It is the European standard, etc., etc. But there is enough in the Puttaswamy judgment to indicate that what we have is indeed the compelling state interest. It's not a given. For example, if government says that I am doing this legislation for A, that A is not presumed even under our constitutional law, the, the union government will still need to come to the courts, for instance, to say, how is it that this objective is achieved by this legislation? That is not presumed merely because the parliament says so. Three, of course, the, the, the doctrine of proportionality, where you need to show that you are adopting a least intrusive means, that is to say, say your measures intrude into privacy as possible that is necessary for the achievement of your aims. But here you don't even have a aims, you only have a vision. So you can't really do a proportionality of these measures. Right? So they've certainly paid lip service to much of literature that has come, so particularly because perhaps it is BD they if you reuse the many of the language and the vocabulary that is uh, that's in vogue in the data protection bill, 
But other than that, uh, those, I mean, uh, in terms of data, da data subject rights, data principle rights, data fiduciary responsibilities, et cetera, et cetera. But those are, you know, yes, I mean, if we accept those as sufficient safeguards, we'll be accepting that, uh, a pain, we'll be accepting penny wisdom and pound foolishness. We need to ask much more searching questions. I don't think we should be so much that is outside the draft. The reason for this uh, health policy in the first place is something that we must inquire, investigate, and of course, the it and uh, and what it means when this, this is pushed through such an in such an undemocratic haste. Thank you. I I think we can go on for questions. All right. Uh, Shorya, you're on mute. Yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, Prasanna. Thank you to both speakers. Uh, uh, I think. Uh, a lot of uh, the discussion surrounding data or uh, laws regarding data protection sometimes uh, sounds uh, very distant and uh, opaque for uh, lay citizens. Uh, even uh, anyone who wishes to respond to uh, all these uh, laws that have been coming one after the one of all these policy documents that have been coming one after the other uh, is often at a loss as to what exactly this is all meant to achieve. And uh, while listening to both of you, I think something that becomes clear is when we look at the law uh, surrounding the data itself, uh, with the larger policy framework surrounding public health or various other aspects of governance and uh, uh, citizenship rights, uh, then I think a clearer picture of what all of this is supposed to be for uh, starts to emerge. Uh, so. Uh, uh, first of all, like from uh, collective, uh, we express our gratitude to both the speakers for uh, expressing so clearly what is in this document and the times we're living in uh, in terms of uh, data. We'd now like to invite uh, everyone who's uh, watching to leave their uh, comments and questions uh, in the comment section below. Uh, just to get this uh, started, uh, maybe a uh, a question uh, for uh, Srinivas uh, would be, uh, since we already spoke about what is happening right now uh, with Vidhi coming in uh, to do a part of the government's job, with iSpert stepping in and volunteering their services to do another part, uh, we see a huge degree of corporate penetration into what would have otherwise been uh, uh, the government's uh, business. Uh, but what is this larger... Um, ecosystem that's being built today, what kind of future does that mean? I mean, what would it be like for an average citizen who's today being asked to part with their data related to their healthcare? If you could paint a picture for uh, someone who's not as well versed with uh, the intricacies of the technology itself. And, yeah. Okay, that's a really important question. Uh, on, like, these things are happening, you see that the private sector at some level, while Prasanna might be using the word embedded within the state, say that the private sector and the state, there's not much of the difference between these two anymore. COVID and with the amount of centralization inside private sector as well, right? If, if you look at what's happening on takeovers and a push towards building a uh, big capital institutions across the world, not, not necessarily in India. Uh, there is a push towards building large companies and large corporations. And that kind of, uh, it, it kind of happened post like globalization allowed uh, big corporates, uh, American corporates, Western corporates uh, to enter markets across the world. And essentially what you're witnessing now, even can we do, is essentially turn India into a market. At the same time, uh, whatever experiments that have been, uh, are being exported, 
it, it, it's not being exported to the Western world. It's actually being exported to other developing nations. So African countries, Latin American countries, and uh, any other countries who may not be, uh, who, who probably cannot afford uh, to pay for software in dollars, uh, India wants to be an alternative, right? Now, why has this emerged? Uh, it's essentially because uh, uh, post 2000s, uh, uh, post the dot com bubble, in fact, uh, late 2000s, post uh, uh, 2008 financial crisis, you see that uh, oil or financial capital has essentially been replaced by data to protect actually emergence from post this crisis. Uh, that's when you see that capital has flown away from other industries to uh, data, right? So, uh, and if you look at the history of uh, Indian state and particularly the IT sector, uh, with, uh, even with competition between each other, all of them are actually uh, together uh, to lobby the government for their interest. You, you see the formation of NASCOM that happens, right? NASCOM was essentially ensuring that the IT industry interest prevail inside government. Uh, and iceberg is no different. Now, all of this uh, has future ramifications. What kind of ramifications? I, I think uh, one must look at advanced information societies like the US, uh, where what the kind of havoc that big tech has created on the for the black communities, for example, right? The African American communities have been uh, uh, one of the key people who have been resisting big tech, whether it's Amazon, whether it's facial recognition, whether it's algorithms inside courtrooms, uh, they were the victims of the of the big tech uh, inside government in deciding policies about a society. So uh, we're not there yet. Okay, ADA did cause some of these problems, uh, but we're quite far away from what uh, US is. But we are getting there and with any debate and by letting iceberg and Vidi dictate some of these decisions, uh, you're looking towards a very lobbyist economy that the US is where corporates and big tech are legally allowed to lobby uh, to essentially get what they want. Uh, I think we're transforming into such a society where accountability might not exist for corporates and uh, that's going to be a serious problem for future. We have questions coming in from the uh, viewers uh, with us today. Uh, so there's a question from Jayashree, which uh, perhaps uh, Prasanna uh, would be able to uh, clarify. Uh, she asks, uh, could you yes, throw more light on the United Kingdom's NHS data, uh, the National Health Service data? They also have medical history databases of citizens. So how is this bill going to make it a privacy concern for India? Well, uh, let us actually talk about it. That's an interesting question. Let us talk about it once there is an NHS-like thing in India. Yeah, I mean, there is universal health care. If that is, that is what we are getting in relation to it, it's certainly something that we can talk about. Right? But if there is no such promise, if there is only saying that you, I mean, you give me your data, I will think about whether to give universal health care. Uh, that's not the same as... Uh, uh, what happens in NHS, at least to my understanding. Yeah. So we can certainly talk about it if there is a certain definitive goal saying that this is healthcare for all. We are going to have an NHS-like system where healthcare is universal and is free, effectively. Let us, if that, if, I mean, if it comes to it, certainly that's something we can talk about. Uh, so once again, I think uh, what you're questioning is the intention behind the policy of what it wants to achieve uh, with all this data. I mean, in terms of healthcare uh, for the average yeah, no, citizen. even before even before questioning the intention, we just need. I am questioning, you know, the the daring to even not be transparent with what their intention is. 
right? That's a whole new level. Right. Uh, just building on that question, uh, do you think uh, you have some comments on what? I mean, are there some countries which have thrown up some models uh, of uh, what kind of data protection should be emulated, or even if there isn't any perfect some uh, kind of model yet, what would you look for in a ideal scenario that we should be working towards? Yeah, first of all, yeah, I refuse to answer that question again because again because it will be like acceding to the terms that has been set by this policy and trying to look within, right? So I mean, it is it once you got the bigger picture, you know, you've lost that battle in terms of you know the rest of the haggling, whether you really have erasure rights, you know, whether you have twenty four hours turnaround or 48 hours turnaround, et cetera. It's just really just hanging. Now, once you've gotten to there, I don't think we should get to that level at all. Uh, so the next question is from uh, Seema. Uh, Seema asks, uh, what kind of coordinated effort is required to create uh, accountability measures uh, or to get the government to state its goals for the data collection and achieve and create systems to negotiate with the citizens. Uh, and thirdly, to figure out that if individual data is going to be shared anyway, should citizens not collect rent on their private data? So assuming that we cannot stop data from being extracted from us, then uh, should we be demanding a rent from the government on our data? Uh, if either of you would like to comment on Seema's suggestion. Yeah, I mean, trying to collect rent. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's. Uh, I think it's a good uh, yeah good idea. Let's see how. <laughs> I don't know how far we'll go with it, but it's certainly something to say. But that is, yeah, I mean, problem is uh, when you say rent, it is as though it is under the law. It is you are trying to give an impression that your privacy is something that can be monetized and traded for. See, that's exactly what we're pushing back against. So it is not like your property. It's not like a jewel that you own. But when it becomes part of your body, it's an extension of your body. The rights that you have is even more. I mean, it's not something that, I mean, it's whether it, it can't be seen as a monetizable resource because you don't really know what its value is. Many cases... I mean, it is very much like healthcare itself, although it is just healthcare data. It is many... And with healthcare itself, you know you can't put a value to it. It's not price elastic, right? I mean, how much do you? I mean, how, how much will you actually spend to save your life? Like everything, right? And uh, similar with most personal data, it's like uh, unless there is certain specific rights enhancing promises that are offered on the other side, I don't think any of these rights should be waived. Even if it is assuming that the government is going to give you a rent for it, maybe they'll give. They have enough money, they'll give. I mean, they, I mean, they'll probably see much more value in taking your data than just holding that rent. And, and the, the other part of it, yeah, the other part of it, I'm sorry. The accountability measures, yes. The, I, I'll just finish this quickly. I think the CAA movement, uh, the anti-CAA movement uh, taught us some lessons certainly some good lessons and also some several bad lessons, right? Uh, of course, that has irked the state, which is why we know the state is coming after everybody who uh, who resisted with, uh, uh, with those people who were protesting uh, against the CAA legislation. It's come, uh, the state is coming after them with all its might. It's certainly irking the state. And that's something that we should keep in mind, right? It is that kind of resistance that seems to um, gets the state to respond, react, right? Certainly not, uh, I mean, in an ideal way, but it's certainly something that is getting the state to take notice. And um, something similar, we'll have to have organized protests. It is, I think, brick and mortar resistance, the way CA, anti-CA movement, I think that's the way we need to resist many of these policies as well. Unfortunately, this has not captured the imagination like it has, right? Kagas ne dikharinge. Health data in the casting, as Rohini Mohan, the journalist, put put out uh, yeah, frame beautifully. That's how we. That's how I think it should come next. 
So again, right. So the, then, just extend to what Prasanna said. Uh, the issue in explaining all of this is like data is a intangible asset. It doesn't exist, right? Like it's 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 not really easy to convey uh, what's happening. Uh, or like, as, as he was trying to say, capture the minds of everyone on uh, what's at stake, right? Like uh, people who understand the issue of constitution and the issue of centralization or the issue of bypassing laws, center-state uh, relationship, uh, would, would would really understand the depths of these. And I'm not I'm not referring to issues of data here. I'm I'm uh, referring to the issues of a uh, democratic country. Uh, now, now, when you boil down to accountability measures, like in any other democratic country, it will be the institutions who should be evaluating, right? Uh, and it's very clear that uh, Icebert and with the these think tanks have figured out how to bypass institutions. You don't need to. You don't need the parliament. Bills as money bills. Uh, you don't need uh, to listen to whatever the Supreme Court says. Tell a policy instead of the law. Uh, so, and all of these accountability measures that were supposed to keep Aadhaar in check failed at some level, right? Uh, and it it kind of increased actually post Modi had. Uh, under the Congress term, you had some checks in place uh, because of a functional democracy at some capacity. Uh, but if you see the trends, uh, any of the institutions uh, have the capacity to actually audit these systems, right? Uh, and if you question why is iSpirit building these systems, what is the partnership that iSport has with Government of India, the Ministry of Health in this case. There is no uh, contract. There is no tender. Uh, all they probably have is a letter from the government inviting iSport to build this. It raises money from the private sector, which is essentially venture capital who is interested in these systems systems uh, will be for the venture capital to invest in and right for profit. Now, in terms of accountability, it's just going to be brick and mortar stuff. But on the other question of uh, uh, getting paid for this data, I think we shouldn't even talk about it. Okay, the moment we agree to trade our data away. Uh, it's essentially we're agreeing to trade our rights away for money to have serious ramifications on other parts. It, it may not be about just data. You have data in CAA and, and, and NPR, right? So that has serious ramifications. Uh, not all data can be traded. Yeah, I mean, generally from what we hear from uh, people who are uh, technologists, there is a huge uh, uh, celebration for moving fast and breaking things and doing everything anew. And the government also seems to be imbibing that spirit. But uh, here you are, two speakers from a technology background who are saying we need to go back to more uh, brick and mortar methods and the more... Uh, uh, perhaps less uh, innovative uh, methods of uh, a mass democratic movement like the movement against the CNRC. So it's just a little uh, uh, different from what we are used to hearing every time there's a discussion about technology. Uh, that ultimately data has to be defended on the grounds of what it will affect, like uh, Srinivas mentioned, data for the CNRC, data for uh, privatizing public health care, for privatizing education and so on. Uh, now, we have another question that has come in from Anumeha. Uh, she asks, uh, can you explain why the government needed to create a health ID? 
what in the Aadhaar Act prohibits it from uh, using it to link health records, and why was this workaround even necessary? Perhaps Prasanna yeah. would. Yeah. Yeah. So this is yeah this is not evident in the policy itself, but I think uh, uh, I heard somebody I think in in a Bloomberg Quint interview. Uh, somebody from Niti Aayog or somebody close to Niti Aayog was being interviewed, and he indicated health ID was brought in because of legal impediments to using Aadhaar Assis. So that is, yeah, ostensibly in reference to the 2018 Supreme Court judgment that uh, that that laid down that uh, that effectively put certain brakes on the scope creep the scope creep of Aadhaar. So they don't want. So they, it's very serious about it. In, I mean, in the sense they don't want any legal impediments for this because of those judgments, and therefore they seem to have created a new ID, and that is what he indicated, and that's the only uh, thing that I've seen. But the policy itself doesn't tell us why Aadhaar could not be used on. Uh, yeah. yeah, so using okay. Aadhaar is another problem, but yeah. they, they they need an ID to link uh, the electronic health records. Uh, so, if you look at some of the technical documents on the architecture, they use the word uh, EHI, public health records, right? So, instead of calling it EHR, electronic health records, uh, iSpot uses the word uh, PHR, public health records, and they use something called the HR ID. So, essentially, whatever it might be, it's a public health record ID, and their architecture is centered around ID because uh, when it was proposed in 2017, at some level, it was just an extension of Aadhaar and the ecosystem. Uh, and, and some of the infrastructure, for example, the consent mechanism to share data within DigiLocker, and it heavily relies on Aadhaar, on an ID rather, on any digital ID. Here is the replacing, the, sorry, uh, Aadhaar, uh, the unique digital ID with with yet another unique digital uh, health ID. Mind you, they are very similar, uh, except one can claim they are different. The of the health ID is uh, an important concern uh, because it will, they will continue to link it uh, with other to deduplicate it and whatnot in future, saying that, look, these people who are receiving Aishman Bharat, they still need to supply Aadhaar, by the way. That's not uh, Aadhaar plus health ID. Because you would need Aadhaar to get DVT and you would need uh, uh, health ID for sharing health data records. So it's actually not just one uh, point of exclusion. Now you have two uh, extra exclusion layers that, that can potentially deny you uh, health care. Uh, there's one, yeah, that's uh, an important point. Uh, sorry, uh, there's just one follow-up as well from uh, Seema, who wants a clarification about whether this health ID will also cover medical services provided privately. If you could take that as well, Prasanna, when you're answering. Well, it, it does. It does. So it provides even, it, in fact, that's, that's the thing. It wants to be the practo, also wants to be the NHS database. Right, it, it, because it also wants all private practitioners to enroll with it. So the point is, okay, so any data you collect, so we can have it. So that's the thing. So it is. So every question that you have as to whether this data can be there is going to be invariably yes, and that is what my yeah reading of the policy is. So there's not one thing that says no. This is a prohibition under this policy for collect collection. I don't think there's even one bit of data that, in there. Uh, yeah, that comes under that prohibition. So, in fact, uh, uh, the the sorry, uh, some parts of the health stack uh, were prepared in partnership with the new foundation by Nandan Nilekani called the Beacon Foundation. B C K N Beacon. It's pronounced Beacon, but uh, spelled B E C K N. What the Beacon Foundation essentially does is it's a uh, transport commerce uh, system 
and they are trying to uh, merge health uh, health stacks some components of health stack with e pharmacies technical uh, requirements are delivered to you uh, because of covid by this uh, logistics layer uh, so your health data by default is linked to pharma requirements so and you could see potential future linkages for insurance uh, you are going to see aadhar plus mobile plus india stack plus linkages to get insurance healthcare insurance right uh, they have new protocols for this so it's it's going to be linking health data it's going to be linking health data with your financial data in fact i think it was anu uh um, anubuyan from uh, from the india span who recently pointed out one of the hospital chains was actually monitoring uh your bank account details to decide how much to charge you in the hospital okay so it's going to be linking all data it's not going to be linking just one data point uh there's a comment that come in from jaya uh, jayashree uh, who adds that uh, so far the government has been asking for both ration card as well as uh, aadhar uh, for bpl users enrolling for ayushman bharat uh, as well as their thumbprint so uh, some of the basic things that they had promised while announcing uh, aadhar has still not been met uh, i mean uh, from uh, what you guys described uh, we seem to have come um, we have already implemented quite a lot of things from what was initially proposed by nandan nilekani when he was writing uh, the tagger report under the previous regime and even the new regime coming in a lot of it has actually perhaps happened faster than before and uh, i mean i remember when the aadhar debate had been going on uh, mr nilekani had uh, once uh, written a editorial in the times of india uh which basically argued that the aadhar was a model which had to be followed for every other kind of change in the data management ecosystem uh since uh, once aadhar had already been built and the data had already been collected it was much harder to demolish uh, such a database and win back uh, uh, citizens rights and therefore like his his argument was that like aadhar everything else should also be brought in with executive action once it had already been established instead of waiting for the hassle of democracy in the parliament and so on uh, and now we are seeing them go against uh, the supreme court uh, verdict in the putuswami case as well through some kinds of uh, work around if uh, both of you could give uh, your uh, estimate on how far exactly have we achieved nandan nilekani's plans for india um, the tagger report as you mentioned already spoke about a lot of these things Uh, with aadhar being one of them the gst network being one component health being one component uh, transport and logistics being one component of uh, the data ecosystem uh, could, could you guys summarize uh, how far we have come and what is still left in uh, mr nilekani's uh, plans for our country if i can I'll, i'll just i'll just sum up what are the upcoming things uh, i think with covid uh, mr nilagini has been going around every tv channel possible and every newspaper possible writing up ads giving interviews that this is an opportunity uh, uh, the crisis is an opportunity for the it industry to start promoting or you push technology everywhere right so uh, one one thing that you're getting is healthcare then there is a push on smart cities okay uh, there is something called the national urban innovation stack by one of the mr nilakeni foundations uh, then you have something called the skill stack uh, that's coming up at uh, ministry of skills and entrepreneurship uh, uh, there uh, there are other stacks uh, there was something called drone stack which came up uh, uh, which uh, they they are they push to digitize education systems now uh one other uh, important system that they're trying to push uh with drones with uh uh aadhar is to link aadhar with land records 
pushed uh, in the name of binami transactions to be eliminated in land uh, it's it's a lot to do with micro credit for farmers in land so there is an un- entire agriculture stack that's popping up uh, you name it um, the, the idea is to essentially digitize every component of uh, intra- interactions uh, from transport uh, Uh, from uh, health, education. So, if if there is probably a department inside the government with the division with its name, it's getting digitized uh, and mandatorily digitized, and and it's going to be through this model of the public-private partnership where private sector is going to build it, but it's going to be run at the cost of public, except. It, it, It's not money the Indian government is pushing; it's our data. So, all right. Um, so we've been uh, in conversation with uh, Srinivas and Prasanna for a bit over an hour now, and uh, the latest uh, policy development that has come in with the national uh, health data uh, policy. Uh, we have a few more days uh, to give. public criticisms and comments on the draft uh, i mean i'd like to thank both the speakers for their time today for laying out uh, very clearly what is in store for us in this document and uh, otherwise uh, with the ruling bjp rss government as well as a number of uh, uh, bangalore boys uh, who have some big plans for uh, intervening with our citizenship rights our basic rights as citizens uh, i think we also got a few pointers about what kinds of resistance have been the most powerful for targeting these uh, set of interests which have come together with the current regime and uh, we'd like to have more such conversations like this to inform our uh, uh, movements our uh, campaigns in the days to come uh, once again uh, like to thank both the speakers for their time today and all the uh, Uh, viewers who could join us and uh, please uh, do keep uh, joining for more such sessions on our social media handles from collective we uh, firmly believe uh, in the slogan towards a free university towards a free society uh, so to build up these kinds of struggles to link up with the larger struggles of uh, toiling people in india link up the issues of privacy with issues of access to basic uh, facilities and fundamental rights uh, we'd like to take forward this campaign and thank all of you for joining us